Hi there, welcome back to another episode of the Mind Your Liberty podcast, where we're looking at liberty, what it is, why you should care about it, and how to defend it. Today's date is Thursday, May 26th, 2022, and I'm your host, Andrew, as always. And we're going to be looking at a piece by Thomas Jefferson today. But first, I just want to go over why we're going over all these old documents. So I started this podcast. I felt it was something that God wanted me to do. I starting off slow. I had a goal of getting one one episode out every month. Failed in April. Not going to fail anymore. And so this will be the second episode in May. But one of the things that I like to listen to a lot is the Path to Liberty episode from the Tenth Amendment Center. In that, he cites all sorts of documents from the American Revolutionary and Founding Era, and he just links them and says, hey, you want to check that out on your own time? I encourage you to do that. Well, in doing that, I have a lot more time to listen than I do to read, and most of those things aren't in audio format. Uh, if you're familiar with LibriVox, they do a lot of open uh, public domain documents in audiobook format, but even there, most of these documents aren't on LibriVox or available to listen to anywhere. So I took it upon myself to use this as easy fodder for the first year of podcast episodes. Coming up here, I'm going to try and do some other series on more current events and uh, topical stuff that I've been learning about and studying. Also, I'm going to try and do some interviews that I think you guys will enjoy. But the historical document readings are really, I think, simple, value-added fodder for podcast episodes because I'm reading through them anyway and I'm thinking I learn so much better if I'm reading it out loud. Might as well make it available for somebody else to learn. And so that's that's why I'm doing this. And also before we dive into our piece today, I want to remind you to go uh, check out the Wordy Wednesday episode I published yesterday. I There were some words I ran into I was unfamiliar with. I covered them in an episode yesterday to define those. That should help you. If you haven't listened to that, stop, go back and listen to that, download it, listen to it. Hopefully that'll help you with some of the words we encounter in this episode. Okay, diving right in here. The piece we're going over was penned by Thomas Jefferson on July 30th, 1774. And to start off, I'm actually just going to read the introduction from teachingamericanhistory.org. I linked to the the site in the uh, description down below, but they, they've got a short introduction that I can't top, so I'm just going to read this. The coercive acts not only sparked outrage among the common people whom Governor Morris derided as members of the mob, they also inflamed the indignation of Americans who occupied positions of power and influence. And I'm just going to remind you, the coercive acts, after the Boston Tea Party, the coercive acts, also known as the intolerable acts, you'll hear them mentioned as referred to as were four acts that Parliament passed kind of in retribution in uh, retaliation, actually, uh, against the Boston Tea Party. Uh, So that's what the coercive acts that it's talking about there is. And then Governor Morris, interestingly enough, I wasn't super familiar with him. I've heard that name, and I always imagined that he was a governor, right? Because it's Governor Morris. But no, that's actually his first name. It's spelled G-O-U-V-E-R-N-E-U-R, Governor Morris. That's the guy's first name. He was a New Yorker. Uh, So anyway, that's aside. Back to the introduction from Teaching American History. I better just start over. The coercive acts not only sparked outrage among the common people who Governor Morris derided as members of the mob, they also inflamed the indignation of Americans who occupied positions of power and influence. One such person was Thomas Jefferson, a member of Virginia's House of Burgesses, who helped write a May 1774 resolution designating a day of fasting and prayer to show solidarity with the people of Massachusetts. Soon after, Lord Dunmore, the royal governor, showed his solidarity with Parliament by dissolving the House of Burgesses. As the elected members of that body prepared to regroup as the extra-legal Virginia Convention, Jefferson drafted for its consideration his Summary View of the Rights of British America. The 31-year-old's argument represented the next step in the progression of radical thought, While earlier critiques of British measures had denied the authority of Parliament to tax the colonies, Jefferson's summary view held that the British Parliament had no right to exercise authority over us, in any circumstance. While earlier opponents of Britain's policies had laid blame on Parliament, Jefferson's argument elevated responsibility to the level of the king, 
Let not the name of George III be a blot in the page of history, Jefferson wrote, reminding the monarch that kings are the servants, not the proprietors of the people. While stirring, Jefferson's words struck many as too much too soon. The Virginia Convention declined to adopt his statement as its own. Several of its members, however, arranged to have it published in Williamsburg as a pamphlet. Soon presses in Philadelphia and London printed their own editions of the Summer Review, which, like most political pamphlets of the era, appeared without its author's name on the title page. Even so, word spread of Jefferson's role. In the summer of 1775, his reputation preceded his arrival as a delegate to the Second Continental Congress, where Rhode Island Representative Samuel Ward recorded his first impression of the famous Mr. Jefferson, whom he sized up as a, quote, very sensible, spirited, fine fellow, and by the pamphlet which he wrote last summer, he certainly is one. That introduction at teachingamericanhistory.org was written by Robert MacDonald. Again, I'll link to that in the description down below. That actually contains the text of a summary view of the rights of British America as well. So in the past, I've read the document and then gone back and gone over a little bit. This time, I think I'm going to try giving you a general kind of outline of where he goes with this and give you a few heads up on some things, and then I'll read the document. Remember, he's presenting this to the Virginia Convention so they can adopt it as their own, which, as we saw, he didn't end up, they didn't end up doing. But anyway, it starts out here, resolved, that it be an instruction to said deputies. And you're going to have to remember that when you hear the word that. He starts a lot of paragraphs with that, and it's like a, seems like an incomplete sentence. In your mind, just remember, he starts it with resolved, and then there's a bunch of that's after that. And so that'll help you if you remember that it's resolved that it be an instruction to the said deputies, resolved, uh, what's the next one? That the exercise of a free trade with all parts of the world, dot, dot, dot. You get the idea. You'll hear those that's and always just go back to the beginning in your mind and say resolved that. So this is what he's proposing for a resolution. So he starts out here with language that you'd expect to be addressing to a monarch. He says, we're presenting to his majesty, begging leave to lay before him as chief magistrate of the British Empire. But then his tone changes pretty quickly there in that same paragraph where he says, where this is penned in the language of truth and divested of all those expressions of servility which would persuade his majesty that we're asking favors and not rights. So he's saying, we're not, not really asking, we're, we're telling his majesty. So he's kind of walking a tightrope there. And then he backs off a little bit in his tone, but then you'll see at the end, towards the end, why, like I said in the introduction, so many people thought it was too much too soon. So as I'm going through this, kind of giving you in a rough outline, I'm going to be paraphrasing some stuff, but hopefully in order it'll help you when you go through and listen to the whole thing. So he says, to remind him that our ancestors before their immigration to America were the free inhabitants of the British dominions in Europe. And he goes on to say that they they went of their own accord and then British America was settled as a free land. And he spends a couple paragraphs on that and then he goes on, say, in that paragraph that started that the exercise of a free trade with all parts of the world, he's saying, basically, you're, you're messing with our free trade. He reminds him of some of the past monarchs that tried to mess with that and uh, how it ended up for him. He ended up losing his head. And there's a great quote. Nestled in there says, History has informed us that bodies of men, as well as individuals, are susceptible of the spirit of tyranny. In the next sentence, A view of these acts of Parliament for regulation, as it has been effectively called, of the American trade, if all of their evidence were removed out of the case, would undeniably evince the truth of this observation. And I like what he says there. He points out that this regulation, as they're calling it, is just barefaced tyranny. And I think that's something we could bring into the present day, too. Uh, somebody said the power to regulate is the power to destroy. I think that was Justice John Marshall. Anyway, moving on. Down here, further on, he gives an example of how their free trade is getting screwed up. An American subject is forbidden to make a hat for himself of the fur which he has taken perhaps on his own soil, an instance of despotism to which no parallel can be produced in the most arbitrary ages of British history. And that reminds me of the more recent famous Gonzalez versus Rage case with Justice Clarence Thomas's uh, dissent in that case. He says, if the federal government can regulate growing a half a dozen cannabis plants for personal consumption, 
not because it is interstate commerce, but because it is inextricably bound up with interstate commerce, then Congress's Article I powers, as explained by the Necessary and Proper Clause, have no meaningful limits. Whether Congress aims at the possession of drugs, guns, or any other number of items, it may continue to, quote, appropriate state police powers under the guise of regulating commerce. He's citing United States v. Morrison there. Anyway, we can get back to this document, but I just wanted to make that connection there because it popped up right in my head right away. And uh, down at the bottom of that paragraph, he really drives it home what he's driving at there. He says, The true ground on which we declare these acts void is that the British Parliament has no right to exercise authority over us. He just lays it out there. Then he goes on to make the case that this isn't an isolated incident. It's happened before. It's been dealt with in the past. And then specifically here in the colonies, it's happened again and again. Great quote nestled in here again. Single acts of tyranny may be ascribed to the accidental opinion of a day, but a series of oppressions begun at a distinguished period and pursued unalterably through every change of ministers too plainly prove a deliberate and systematical plan of reducing us to slavery. Kind of sounds, there's very similar language to something else that Thomas Jefferson helped pen, right? The Declaration of Independence a year later, he says, but what, how's it go? A chain of usurpations pursuing invariably the same object or something like that. I'm actually going to cover that. I'm planning on covering that in July. So he goes over several other acts. And also, uh, just to warn you, he quotes the names of a lot of acts in here verbatim. And it's really hard, when I was reading through it, I had a hard time separating where he's quoting the name of an act to continue in his sentence. So I did my best, realized that when he says, an act for the suspending of the legislature of New York, sometimes it's hard to separate that. So I apologize for that. I'm not sure what I could have done differently. Just kind of wrestle with it and try and pay attention when you hear an act pay attention to where that ends and the next thought begins. And then he makes the case here that Parliament can't have authority to legislate in the colonies or to dissolve the colonies' legislature that they've elected themselves. Uh, specifically for one reason he mentions here, I'll just read it. He says, Can any one reason be assigned why 160,000 electors in the island of Great Britain should give law to four millions in the states of America every individual of whom is equal to every individual of them, in virtue, in understanding, and in bodily strength. So he's saying there, because Parliament is the representatives of the people, 160,000 electors there in Great Britain, by them legislating over the colonies, basically there's 160,000 people telling 4 million people what to do. And he goes on to say, I'm going to skip some, you'll hear it all later. Were this to be admitted, instead of being a free people, as we've hitherto supposed, we'd be found to be slaves, not of one, but of 160,000 tyrants, distinguished too from all others by the singular circumstance that they are removed from the reach of fear, the only restraining motive which may hold the hand of a tyrant. And that in itself is a great principle to note there. The restraining motive which may hold the hand of a tyrant is the fear of the people. You read Machiavelli's The Prince, and you get the same idea. Even a tyrant, even a prince, has to kind of walk a tightrope there between ticking off the people and pleasing his lords and such. But if the 160,000 people in Britain are making rules for the 4 million people in the colonies, then they're removed from the reach of fear. There's no recourse there. There's no recourse. We can't sail 4 million people across the continent, or excuse me, across the ocean. And we have a similar situation now because... Really, the government, there's a shadow government right now, right? There's there's the people we elect. There's, of course, our state governments that are still pretty, pretty accountable. And then there's our House of Representatives and the Senate, which really, they're, they're only moderately accountable. They can be voted out, but what are the odds of that actually happening? Most of the time, it doesn't happen. But even if they are, there's a constant bureaucracy that never moves. Everything's been given over to the administrative state, and there's nothing we can do about it. There's no legal recourse to do any of this. There is the Justice Department, which is supposed to be reining this stuff in. There's checks and balances, but they're all broken, and rarely you see any of them work. And so we've got the same problem today, is that 
the tyrants are removed from the hand of fear. And I would add, similar situation to what Jefferson's describing here, a little bit different, is it's not just one tyrant. There's a whole bunch of them. It's a whole mega state of bureaucracy. But people, anytime somebody just votes in the other side, if there's a blue blue guy in, they vote in the red guy and they give him more power. Anytime you give more and more power to the centralized government, you're you're actually causing the problem. We've got to focus on our local governments. We've got to mind our own liberty. Take back your state governments. Take back your county. Take back your school board. Take back your city council. That's where it's at. That's what the left has done. That's what we've got to do. And we've got to stop ceding power. Again, I don't know what to do because if I tell Josh Hawley, as much as I like Josh Hawley, if I tell Josh Hawley not to vote for this mega spending bill, he's going to vote for it. There's nothing I can do about it. Okay, moving on. In the next paragraph, he goes on to talk about uh, one of the intolerable acts that closed the Boston port to all commerce. And again, talking about free trade, screwing with the free trade, they totally closed the Boston port to all commerce. And again, great quotes. There's quotes all through here, but I'm just going to try and highlight them so they stick out when you when you listen to it. He goes on to say, there are extraordinary situations which require extraordinary interposition. And exasperated people who feel that they possess power are not easily restrained within limits strictly regular. A number of them assembled in the town of Boston threw tea into the ocean. And so he's saying that's what precipitated this act, closing the Boston Harbor. And he talks about that for a little bit, and it's all good. I encourage you to listen closely to it. And then he goes on to say, If the pulse of this people shall beat calmly under this experiment, the closing of the Boston Harbor, another and another will be tried till the measure of despotism be filled up. And again, how applicable is that to where we're at today? It's one thing after another. Now the ATF, again, regulatory bureaucracy, this isn't, these rules aren't being made. It's by the legislature. It's executive fiat. And it's, but the one that comes to mind is the uh, banning of the ghost guns. Even if it could be done, it's insane and it's unconstitutional. It goes against the Second, uh, second Amendment. So how much are we going to put up with? I don't know. I don't know what the recourse is. I don't know what the proper thing is. But I do know that we can get our own houses in order, that we can get our own lives in order. We can get right with God. We can mind our own liberty. And in so doing, we're going to be making the stronger family, the stronger community, the stronger church, stronger city. That is where we start. And when God gives us an opportunity to stand up for truth and righteousness on a bigger platform, we take it as it comes. Then he goes on to talk about an act where they're yanking people out of the colonies to try them in Great Britain. And he goes on to break down that a little bit. And that's one of those words recognizance that we went over yesterday. And then we get down to the next paragraph, or several paragraphs down actually, where he says, We next proceed to consider the conduct of his majesty as holding the executive powers of the laws of these states and mark out his deviations from the line of duty. This is where he really starts to lay the blame at the feet of his majesty, King George III, instead of Parliament, as most of the letters seeking redress had been very flattering of his majesty and been laying the blame at Parliament, saying, Parliament's doing this, Parliament's doing this. But Thomas Jefferson takes a different line here, and he lays the f- the blame at the feet of King George III. And I think this is where a lot of people thought he was doing too much too soon. Ultimately, we know... We know how it ended up going, but again, as the introduction pointed out, this was published far and wide, and you can imagine King George reading this in London, how this felt. And he talks about how, he goes into some history about how the king has power, negative power over the laws of parliament, and he goes again into some history of how that's been used in the past, how he thinks King George should be using it, how he's using it to keep good laws from being enacted in the colonies by our legislatures and how he's refusing to put his negative to laws that should be given negative from Parliament. Basically, if you read between the lines, he's calling King George a bad king. And he goes into some good history there, and it's pretty easy to understand, I think, although it helped when I was reading it and reading it and looking it up. And again, good quote I'm going to highlight here. When the representative body have lost the confidence of their constituents, 
when they have notoriously made sale of their most valuable rights, when they have assumed to themselves powers which the people never put into their hands, then indeed their continuing in office becomes dangerous to the state and calls for an exercise of the power of dissolution. And he goes on to say, you know, that's probably dangerous, but just throwing it out there. And he makes an important point that if the king insists on, or parliament insists on, dissolving the legislatures in the colonies, that the way the way this works is that the power reverts to the people, who may exercise it to an unlimited extent, either assembling together in person, sending deputies, or in any other way they may think proper. And then he goes on to say, We forbear to trace the consequences further. The dangers are conspicuous with which this practice is replete. Saying not something we enter into lightly, but he makes the point there, the power reverts to the people. And that's the way it works. It's the way it still works. God gave the people the power. God gave people the authority. We delegate that authority. And in that case, they had made legislatures in and of themselves. They elected their own representatives, and they were governed in and of themselves. And the king dissolved those legislatures through his agents, the governors, the power was supposed to revert to the people. And he, and that's basically what the Virginia Convention was. It was, they didn't sit there and wait for permission. And that's another problem. I'm going to get off on a rabbit trail here. Every time some government does something it's not supposed to do, well, let's wait and see. Let's see what the district court does. Oh, the district court. Oh, it's appealed. Let's see what the appellate court does. Oh, the appellate court didn't. Do, okay, well, let's see what the Supreme Court does. And if the Supreme Court says we don't have that right, I guess I guess we don't have that right. Or if the power, oh, the Supreme Court says the power doesn't revert to the people. Well, I guess I guess we're all just cyborgs plugged into a machine now. Okay, I'm getting a little far off there. <laughs> okay, getting back to the document, he then takes another extensive section to go over the history of land holdings. He kind of returns to where he started with it being settled as a free land, and he goes over this alloidal versus feudal land, and I'll let you listen to that, because he does a pretty good job covering it. Again, if you missed the Wordy Wednesday episode, go back and listen to that. And then he moves on to uh, talking about the king sending armed forces onto their shores. He says he doesn't have the power to do that, but, quote, did his majesty possess such a right as this? It might swallow up all our other rights whenever he should think proper. But his majesty has no right to land a single armed man on our shores. And so he goes in again to some history of when this has been tried and when how it's inappropriate. And he ends that paragraph with a good one. Can he erect a power superior to that which erected himself? He has done it indeed by force. But let him remember that force cannot give right. Saying just because he did it doesn't mean it's right. Doesn't mean it's legitimate. It's fiat. It's fake. It's usurped authority. It's arbitrary. These are all words you're probably getting familiar with listening to this podcast. Then he goes and he kind of pads his speech a little bit and makes it sound like he wasn't just laying all this blame at the foot of the king. And he says, the colonies really have no desire to separate from Great Britain, which I think was probably true at that time. Everybody just kind of wanted to get along, but they weren't going to they weren't going to get along at the cost of their rights, at the cost of their freedom, because they understood that once arbitrary power had a grasp, then they were going to be slaves, their children were going to be slaves, they were going to be subject to whatever the whim of whoever, even if King George turned out to be a good guy and a good ruler, they were ceding that power to him so that the next monarch could be a tyrant. I think he's already made the case that he thinks George III is acting like a tyrant. And I'll just, uh, he ends up here with a, another good quote, the God who gave us life gave us liberty at the same time. The hand of force may destroy, but cannot disjoin them. All right. I also, I've missed it in there somewhere. Uh, back up where he was talking about the king not giving his negative to bad laws and continually giving his negative to, he was refusing to give his assent to good laws, such as Thomas Jefferson says that basically they would have abolished slavery. There were several laws passed by the local colonial bodies to abolish the slave trade. But the king said, nope, you're not doing that. So I haven't looked into that. Maybe one of you can look into that and email me. Let me know what that's all about. I've never heard that before. But I thought it was interesting and worth pointing out again. 
especially since this is Virginia, which of course was a big slave trading state. Okay, well, that's pretty much the overview. Hopefully it's not too disjointed. Hopefully that prepped you for listening to the whole document unabridged. So without further ado, here it is. I'll catch you on the other side. A Summary View of the Rights of British America by Thomas Jefferson Resolved that it be an instruction to the said deputies when assembled in general Congress with the deputies from the other states of British America to propose to the said Congress that an humble and dutiful address be presented to His Majesty, begging leave to lay before him, as the Chief Magistrate of the British Empire, the united complaints of His Majesty's subjects in America, complaints which are excited by many unwarrantable encroachments and usurpations, attempted to be made by the legislator of one part of the empire, upon those rights which God and the laws have given equally and independently to all. To represent to his majesty that these his states have often individually made humble application to his imperial throne, to obtain through its intervention some redress of their injured rights, to which none of which was ever even an answer condescended. Humbly to hope that this their joint address, penned in the language of truth, and divested of those expressions of servility which would persuade His Majesty that we are asking favors and not rights, shall obtain from His Majesty a more respectful acceptance. And this His Majesty will think we have reason to expect, when he reflects, that he is no more than the chief officer of the people, appointed by the laws, and circumscribed with definite powers, to assist in working the great machine of government, erected for their use, and consequently subject to their superintendence. And in order that these, our rights, as well as the invasions of them, may be laid more fully before His Majesty, to take a view of them from the origin and first settlement of these countries, to remind Him that our ancestors, before their immigration to America, were the free inhabitants of the British dominions in Europe, and possessed a right which nature has given to all men of departing from their country in which chance, not choice, has placed them, of going in quest of new habitations, and of there establishing new societies under such laws and regulations as to them shall seem most likely to promote public happiness. That their Saxon ancestors had, under this universal law, in like manner left their native wilds and woods in the north of Europe, had possessed themselves of the island of Britain, then less charged with inhabitants, and had established there that system of laws which has so long been the glory and protection of that country nor was ever any claim of superiority or dependence asserted over them by that mother country from which they had migrated. And were such a claim made, it is believed that His Majesty's subjects in Great Britain have too firm a feeling of the rights derived to them from their ancestors to bow down the sovereignty of their state before such visionary pretensions. And it is thought that no circumstance has occurred to distinguish materially the British from the Saxon immigration. America was conquered, and her settlements made and firmly established at the expense of individuals and not of the British public. Their own blood was spilt in acquiring the lands for their settlement, their own fortunes expended in making that settlement effectual. For themselves they fought, for themselves they conquered, and for themselves alone they have right to hold. Not a shilling was ever issued from the public treasuries of His Majesty or His ancestors for their assistance, till of very late times, after the colonies had become established on a firm and permanent footing. That then, indeed, having become valuable to Great Britain for her commercial purposes, his Parliament was pleased to lend them assistance against an enemy, who would fain have drawn to herself the benefits of their commerce, to the great aggrandizement of herself, and danger of Great Britain. Such assistance, and in such circumstances, they had often before given to Portugal and other allied states, with whom they carry on a commercial intercourse, Yet these states never supposed that by calling in her aid they thereby submitted themselves to her sovereignty. Had such terms been proposed, they would have rejected them with disdain, and trusted for better to the moderation of their enemies or to a vigorous exertion of their own force. We do not, however, mean to underrate those aids, which were to us doubtless valuable, on whatever principles granted. But we would show that they cannot give a title to that authority which the British Parliament would arrogate over us and that they may amply be repaid by our giving to the inhabitants of Great Britain such exclusive privileges in trade as may be advantageous to them, and at the same time not too restrictive to ourselves. 
that settlements having been thus affected in the wilds of America, the immigrants thought proper to adopt that system of laws under which they had hitherto lived in the mother country, and to continue their union with her by submitting themselves to the same common sovereign, who was thereby made the central link connecting the several parts of the empire thus newly multiplied. But that not long ago they were permitted, however far they thought themselves removed from the hand of oppression, to hold undisturbed the rights thus acquired, at the hazard of their lives, and the loss of their fortunes. A family of princes was then on the British throne, whose treasonable crimes against their people brought on them afterwards the exertion of those sacred and sovereign rights of punishment reserved in the hands of the people, for cases of extreme necessity, and judged by the Constitution unsafe to be delegated to any other judicature. While every day brought forth some new and unjustifiable exertion of power over their subjects on that side the water, it was not to be expected that those here, much less able at that time to oppose the designs of despotism, should be exempted from injury. Accordingly, that country, which had been acquired by the lives, the labors, and the fortunes of individual adventurers, was by these princes at several times parted out and distributed among the favorites and followers of their fortunes, and by an assumed right of the crown alone, were erected into distinct and independent governments, a measure which it is believed His Majesty's prudence and understanding would prevent him from imitating at this day, as no exercise of such a power, of dividing and dismembering a country, has ever occurred in His Majesty's realm of England, though now of very ancient standing, nor could it be justified or acquiesced under there, or in any other part of His Majesty's empire. That the exercise of a free trade with all parts of the world, possessed by the American colonies as a natural right, and which no law of their own had taken away or abridged, was next the object of unjust encroachment. Some of the colonies, having thought proper to continue the administration of their government in the name and under the authority of His Majesty King Charles I, whom, notwithstanding his late deposition by the Commonwealth of England, they continued in the sovereignty of their state. The Parliament for the Commonwealth took the same high offense, and assumed upon themselves the power of prohibiting their trade with all other parts of the world except the island of Great Britain. This arbitrary act, however, they soon recalled, and by solemn treaty, entered into on the twelfth day of March, 1651, between the said commonwealth by their commissioners and the colony of Virginia by their house of Burgesses, it was expressly stipulated by the eighth article of the said treaty that they should have free trade as the people of England do enjoy all places and with all nations, according to the laws of that commonwealth. But that, upon the restoration of His Majesty King Charles II, their rights of free commerce fell once more a victim to arbitrary power and by several acts of his reign, as well as some of his successors, the trade of the colonies was laid under such restrictions as show what hopes they might form from the justice of a British Parliament were its uncontrolled power admitted over these states. History has informed us that bodies of men, as well as individuals, are susceptible of the spirit of tyranny. A view of these acts of Parliament, for regulation, as it has been effectively called, of the American trade, if all other evidence were removed out of the case, would undeniably evince the truth of this observation. Besides the duties they impose on our articles of export and import, they prohibit our going to any market northward of Cape Finisterre in the Kingdom of Spain for the sale of commodities which Great Britain will not take from us, and for the purchase of others with which she cannot supply us, and that for no other than the arbitrary purposes of purchasing for themselves, by a sacrifice of our rights and interests, certain privileges in their commerce with an allied state, who in confidence that their exclusive trade with America will be continued, while the principles and power of the British Parliament be the same, have indulged themselves in every exorbitance which their avarice could dictate or our necessities extort, have raised their commodities called for in America to the double and treble of what they were sold for before such exclusive privileges were given them, and of what better commodities of the same kind would cost us elsewhere, and at the same time given us much less for what we carry thither than might be had at more convenient ports. That these acts prohibit us from carrying in quest of other purchasers the surplus of our tobaccos remaining after the consumption of Great Britain is supplied, so that we must leave them with a British merchant for whatever he will please to allow us, to be by him reshipped to foreign markets, 
where he will reap the benefits of making the sale of them for full value. That, to heighten still the idea of parliamentary justice, and to show with what moderation they are like to exercise power, where themselves are to feel no part of its weight. We take leave to mention to His Majesty certain other acts of British Parliament, by which they would prohibit us from manufacturing for our own use the articles we raise on our own lands with our own labor. By an act passed in the fifth year of the reign of His Late Majesty King George the Second, an American subject is forbidden to make a hat for himself of the fur which he has taken, perhaps on his own soil an instance of despotism to which no parallel can be produced in the most arbitrary ages of British history. By one other act, passed in the twenty-third year of the same reign, the iron which we make we are forbidden to manufacture, and heavy as that article is, and necessary in every branch of husbandry, besides commission and insurance, we are to pay freight for it to Great Britain, and freight for it back again, for the purpose of supporting not men, but machines in the island of Great Britain." In the same spirit of equal and impartial legislation is to be viewed the act of Parliament passed in the fifth year of the same reign, by which American lands are made subject to the demands of British creditors, while their own lands were still continued unanswerable for their debts, from which one of these conclusions must necessarily follow, either that justice is not the same in America as in Britain, or else that the British Parliament pay less regard to it here than there but that we do not point out to His Majesty the injustice of these acts with intent to rest on that principle the cause of their nullity, but to show that experience confirms the propriety of these political principles which exempt us from the jurisdiction of the British Parliament. The true ground on which we declare these acts void is that the British Parliament has no right to exercise authority over us. That these exercises of usurped power have not been confined to instances alone in which themselves were interested, but that they have also intermeddled with the regulation of the internal affairs of the colonies. The Act of the Ninth of Anne for establishing a post office in America seems to have had little connection with British convenience, except that of accommodating His Majesty's ministers and favorites with the sale of a lucrative and easy office. That thus we have hastened through the reigns which preceded His Majesty's, during which the violation of our rights were less alarming, because repeated at more distant intervals than that rapid and bold succession of injuries which is likely to distinguish the present from all other periods of American story. Scarcely have our minds been able to emerge from the astonishment into which one stroke of parliamentary thunder has involved us, before another more heavy, more alarming, is fallen on us. Single acts of tyranny may be ascribed to the accidental opinion of a day, but a series of oppressions begun at a distinguished period, and pursued unalterably through every change of ministers, too plainly prove a deliberate and systematical plan of reducing us to slavery. That the Act, passed in the fourth year of His Majesty's reign, entitled An Act for Granting Certain Duties in the British Colonies and Plantations in America, etc., one other Act, passed in the fifth year of His reign, entitled an act for granting and applying certain stamp duties and other duties in the British colonies and plantations in America, etc. One other act passed in the sixth year of his reign, entitled, An Act for the Better Securing the Dependency of His Majesty's Dominion in America upon the Crown and Parliament of Great Britain. And one other act passed in the seventh year of his reign, entitled, An Act for Granting Duties on Paper, Tea, etc. Form that connected chain of parliamentary usurpation which has already been the subject of frequent applications to His Majesty and the Houses of Lords and Commons of Great Britain. And no answers having yet been condescended to any of these, we shall not trouble His Majesty with a repetition of the matters they contained. But that one other act, passed in the same seventh year of his reign, having been a peculiar attempt, must ever require peculiar mention. It is entitled, An Act for Suspending the Legislature of New York. One free and independent legislature here takes upon itself to suspend the powers of another, free and independent as itself, thus exhibiting a phenomenon unknown in nature, the creator and the creature of its own power. Not only the principles of common sense, but the common feelings of human nature must be surrendered up before His Majesty's subjects here can be persuaded to believe that they hold their political existence at the will of a British Parliament. Shall these governments be dissolved? their property annihilated, and their people reduced to a state of nature. 
at the imperious breath of a body of men, whom they never saw, in whom they never confided, and over whom they have no powers of punishment or removal, let their crimes against the American people be ever so great. Can any one reason be assigned why 160,000 electors in the island of Great Britain should give law to four millions in the state of America, every individual of whom is equal to every individual of them in virtue, in understanding, and in bodily strength? Were this to be admitted, instead of being a free people as we have hitherto supposed, and mean to continue ourselves, we should suddenly be found the slaves, not of one, but of 160,000 tyrants, distinguished too from all others by this singular circumstance, that they are removed from the reach of fear, the only restraining motive which may hold the hand of a tyrant, that by an act to discontinue in such manner and for such time as are therein mentioned the landing and discharging, lading or shipping of goods, wares, and merchandise at the town and within the harbor of Boston in the province of Massachusetts Bay in North America, which was passed in the last session of British Parliament, a large and populous town whose trade was their sole subsistence was deprived of that trade and involved in utter ruin. Let us for a while suppose the question of right suspended in order to examine this act on principles of justice. An act of Parliament had been passed imposing duties on teas to be paid in America, against which act the Americans had protested as inauthoritative. The East India Company, who till that time had never sent a pound of tea to America on their own account, step forth on that occasion the asserters of parliamentary right, and send hither many shiploads of that obnoxious commodity. The masters of their several vessels, however, on their arrival in America, wisely attended to admonition and returned with their cargoes. In the province of New England alone the remonstrances of the people were disregarded, and a compliance after being many days waited for was flatly refused. Whether in this the master of the vessel was governed by his obstinacy, or his instructions, let those who know say, there are extraordinary situations which require extraordinary interposition. An exasperated people, who feel that they possess power, are not easily restrained within limits strictly regular. A number of them, assembled in the town of Boston, threw the tea into the ocean, and dispersed without doing any other act of violence. If in this they did wrong, they were known and were amenable to the laws of the land, against which it could not be objected that they had ever, in any instance, been obstructed or diverted from their regular course in favor of popular offenders. They should therefore not have been distrusted on this occasion. But that ill-fated colony had formerly been bold in their enmities against the House of Stuart, and were now devoted to ruin by that unseen hand which governs the momentous affairs of this great empire." on the partial representations of a few worthless ministerial dependents, whose constant office it has been to keep that government embroiled, and who, by their treacheries, hope to obtain the dignity of the British knighthood, without calling for a party accused, without asking for a proof, without attempting a distinction between the guilty and the innocent, the whole of that ancient and wealthy town is in a moment reduced from opulence to beggary. Men who had spent their lives in extending the British commerce who had invested in that place the wealth their honest endeavors had merited, found themselves and their families thrown at once on the world for subsistence by its charities. Not the hundredth part of the inhabitants of that town had been concerned in the act complained of. Many of them were in Great Britain and in other parts beyond sea. Yet all were involved in one indiscriminate ruin, by a new executive power, unheard of till then, that of a British Parliament. A property of the value of many millions of money was sacrificed to revenge, not repay, the loss of a few thousands. This is administering justice with a heavy hand indeed, and when is this tempest to be arrested in its course? Two wharfs are to be opened again when His Majesty shall think proper. The residue which lined the extensive shores of the Bay of Boston are forever interdicted the exercise of commerce. This little exception seems to have been thrown in for no other purpose than that of setting a precedent for investing His Majesty with legislative powers. If the pulse of his people shall beat calmly under this experiment, another and another will be tried, till the measure of despotism be filled up. It would be an insult on common sense to pretend that this exception was made in order to restore its commerce to that great town. The trade, which cannot be received at two wharfs alone, must of necessity be transferred to some other place, 
to which it will soon be followed by that of the two wharfs. Considered in this light, it would be an insolent and cruel mockery at the annihilation of the town of Boston. By the act for the suppression of riots and tumults in the town of Boston, passed also in the last session of Parliament, a murder committed there is, if the governor pleases, to be tried in the court of the King's Bench in the island of Great Britain by a jury of Middlesex. The witnesses, too, on receipt of such a sum as the governor shall think it reasonable for them to expend, are to enter into recognizance to appear at the trial. This is, in other words, taxing them to the amount of their recognizance, and that amount may be whatever a governor pleases. For who does his majesty think can be prevailed on to cross the Atlantic for the sole purpose of bearing evidence to a fact? His expenses are to be borne, indeed, as they shall be estimated by a governor. But who are to feed the wife and children whom he leaves behind, and who have no other subsistence but his daily labor? Those epidemical disorders, too, so terrible in a foreign climate, is the cure of them to be estimated among the articles of expense, and their danger to be warded off by the almighty power of Parliament? And the wretched criminal, if he happen to have offended on the American side, stripped of his privilege of trial by peers of his vicinage, removed from the place where alone full evidence could be obtained, without money, without counsel, without friends, without exculpatory proof, is tried before judges predetermined to condemn. The cowards who would suffer a countryman to be torn from the bowels of their society in order to be thus offered a sacrifice to parliamentary tyranny would merit that everlasting infamy now fixed on the authors of the act. A clause for the similar purpose had been introduced into an act, passed in the twelfth year of His Majesty's reign, entitled, An Act for the Better Securing and Preserving of His Majesty's Dockyards, Magazines, Ships, Ammunition, and Stores, against which, as meriting the same censures, the several colonies have already protested. That these are the acts of power, assumed by a body of men, foreign to our constitutions, and unacknowledged by our laws, against which we do, on behalf of the inhabitants of British America, enter this our solemn and determined protest, and we do earnestly entreat His Majesty, as yet the only mediatory power between the several states of the British Empire, to recommend to his Parliament of Great Britain the total revocation of these acts, which, however nugatory they be, may yet prove the cause of further discontents and jealousies among us. That we next proceed to consider the conduct of His Majesty as holding the executive powers of the laws of these states, and mark out his deviations from the line of duty. By the Constitution of Great Britain, as well as of the several American states, his Majesty possesses the power of refusing to pass into a law any bill which has already passed the other two branches of legislature. His Majesty, however, and his ancestors, conscious of the impropriety of opposing their single opinion to the united wisdom of two houses of Parliament, while their proceedings were unbiased by interested principles, for several ages past have modestly declined the exercise of this power in that part of his empire called Great Britain, but, by change of circumstances, other principles than those of justice simply have obtained an influence on their determinations. The addition of new states to the British Empire has produced an addition of new and sometimes opposite interests. It is now, therefore, the great office of His Majesty to resume the exercise of his negative power, and to prevent the passage of laws by any one legislature of the empire, which might bear injuriously on the rights and interests of another, Yet this will not excuse the wanton exercise of this power which we have seen His Majesty practice on the laws of the American legislatures. For the most trifling reasons, and sometimes for no conceivable reason at all, His Majesty has rejected laws of the most salutary tendency. The abolition of domestic slavery is the great object of desire in those colonies where it was unhappily introduced in their infant state. But previous to the enfranchisement of the slaves we have, it is necessary to exclude all further importations from Africa. Yet our repeated attempts to effect this by prohibitions, and by imposing duties which might amount to a prohibition, have been hitherto defeated by His Majesty's negative. Thus, preferring the immediate advantages of a few African corsairs to the lasting interests of the American states, and to the rights of human nature, deeply wounded by this infamous practice, Nay, the single interposition of an interested individual against a law was scarcely ever known to fail of success, though in the opposite scale were placed the interests of a whole country. That this is so shameful an abuse of power, trusted with His Majesty for other purposes, as if not reformed, 
would call for some legal restrictions. With equal inattention to the necessities of his people here, has His Majesty permitted our laws to lie neglected in England for years, neither confirming them by his assent, nor annulling them by his negative, so that such of them as have no suspending clause we hold on the most precarious of all tenures, His Majesty's will. And such of them as suspend themselves till His Majesty's assent be obtained, we have feared, might be called into existence at some future and distant period, when time and change of circumstances shall have rendered them destructive to his people here. And to render this grievance still more oppressive, his majesty, by his instructions, has laid his governors under such restrictions that they can pass no law of any moment unless it have such suspending clause, so that, however immediate may be the call for legislative interposition, the law cannot be extended till it has twice crossed the Atlantic, by which time the evil may have spent its whole force. But in what terms reconcilable to majesty, and at the same time to truth, shall we speak of a late instruction to his majesty's governor of the colony of Virginia, by which he is forbidden to assent to any law for the division of a county, unless the new county will consent to have no representative in the assembly? That colony has as yet fixed no boundary to the westward. Their western counties, therefore, are of indefinite extent. Some of them are actually seated many hundred miles from their eastern limits. Is it possible, then, that His Majesty can have bestowed a single thought on the situation of those people, who, in order to obtain justice for injuries, however great or small, must, by the laws of that colony, attend their county court at such a distance, with all their witnesses, monthly, till their litigation be determined? Or does His Majesty seriously wish, and publish it to the world, that his subjects should give up the glorious right of representation, with all the benefits derived from that, and submit themselves the absolute slaves of his sovereign will? Or is it rather meant to confine the legislative body to their present numbers, that they may be the cheaper bargain whenever they shall become worth a purchase? One of the articles of impeachment against Tresillian and the other judges of the Westminster Hall in the reign of Richard II, for which they suffered death as traitors to their country, was that they had advised the king that he might dissolve his parliament at any time, and succeeding kings have adopted the opinion of these unjust judges. Since the establishment, however, of the British Constitution, at the glorious revolution, on its free and ancient principles, neither His Majesty nor his ancestors have exercised such a power of dissolution in the island of Great Britain. And when His Majesty was petitioned, by the united voice of his people there, to dissolve the present Parliament, who had become obnoxious to them, his ministers were heard to declare in open Parliament that His Majesty possessed no such power by the Constitution. But how different their language in his practice here, to declare, as their duty required, the known rights of their country, to oppose the usurpations of every foreign judicature, to disregard the imperious mandates of a minister or governor, have been the avowed causes of dissolving houses of representatives in America. But if such powers be really vested in His Majesty, can he suppose they are there placed to all the members from such purposes as these? When the representative body have lost the confidence of their constituents, when they have notoriously made sale of their most valuable rights, when they have assumed to themselves powers which the people never put into their hands, then indeed their continuing in office becomes dangerous to the state and calls for an exercise of the power of dissolution. Such being the causes for which the representative body should and should not be dissolved, will it not appear strange to an unbiased observer that that of Great Britain was not dissolved, while those of the colonies have repeatedly incurred that sentence. But your majesty, or your governors, have carried this power beyond every limit known, or provided for by the laws. After dissolving one house of representatives, they have refused to call another, so that, for a great length of time, the legislature provided by the laws has been out of existence. From the nature of things, every society must at all times possess within itself the sovereign powers of legislation. The feelings of human nature revolt against the supposition of a state so situated as that it may not in any emergency provide against dangers which perhaps threaten immediate ruin. While those bodies are in existence to whom the people have delegated the powers of legislation, they alone possess and may exercise their powers. But when they are dissolved by the lopping off of one or more of their branches— the power reverts to the people, who may exercise it to the unlimited extent, either assembling together in person, sending deputies, or in any other way they may think proper. We forbear to trace consequences further. The dangers are conspicuous with which this practice is replete. 
that we shall at this time also take notice of an error in the nature of our land holdings, which crept in at a very early period in our settlement. The introduction of the feudal tenures into the kingdom of England, though ancient, is well enough understood to set this matter in a proper light. In the earlier ages of the Saxon settlement, feudal holdings were certainly altogether unknown, and very few, if any, had been introduced at the time of the Norman conquest. Our Saxon ancestors held their lands, as they did their personal property, in absolute dominion, disencumbered with any superior, answering nearly to the nature of those possessions which the feudalists term alloidial. William the Norman first introduced that system generally. The lands which had belonged to those who fell in the Battle of Hastings, and in the subsequent insurrections of his reign, formed a considerable proportion of the lands of the whole kingdom. These he granted out, subject to feudal duties, as he did also those of a great number of his new subjects, who by persuasions or threats were induced to surrender them for that purpose. But still, much was left in the hands of his Saxon subjects, held of no superior, and not subject to feudal conditions. These, therefore, by express laws enacted to render uniform the system of military defense, were made liable to the same military duties as if they had been feuds. And the Norman lawyer soon found means to saddle them also with all the other feudal burthens. But still they had not been surrendered to the king. They were not derived from his grant, and therefore they were not holden of him. A general principle, indeed, was introduced that all lands in England were held either mediately or immediately of the crown. But this was borrowed from those holdings, which were truly feudal, and only applied to others for the purpose of illustration. Feudal holdings were, therefore, but exceptions out of the Saxon laws of possession, under which all lands were held in absolute right. These, therefore, still form the basis or groundwork of the common law, to prevail wheresoever the exceptions have not taken place. America was not conquered by William the Norman, nor its lands surrendered to him, or any of his successors. Possessions there are undoubtedly of the alloidal nature. Our ancestors, however, who migrated hither, were farmers, not lawyers. The fictitious principle that all lands belong originally to the king, they were early persuaded to believe real, and accordingly took grants of their own lands from the crown. And while the crown continued to grant for small sums, and on reasonable rents, there was no inducement to arrest the heir and lay it open to public view. But his majesty has lately taken on him to advance the terms of purchase and of holding to the double of what they were, by which means the acquisition of lands being rendered difficult, the population of our country is likely to be checked. It is time, therefore, for us to lay this matter before his majesty and to declare that he has no right to grant lands of himself. From the nature and purpose of civil institutions, all the lands within the limits which any particular society has circumscribed around itself are assumed by that society, and subject to their allotment only. This may be done by themselves, assembled collectively, or by their legislature, to whom they may have delegated sovereign authority. And if they are allotted in either of these ways, each individual of the society may appropriate to himself such lands as he finds vacant, and occupancy will give him title." that in order to enforce the arbitrary measures before complained of, His Majesty has from time to time sent among us large bodies of armed forces, not made up of the people here, nor raised by the authority of our laws. Did His Majesty possess such a right as this, it might swallow up all our other rights whenever he should think proper. But His Majesty has no right to land a single armed man on our shores, and those whom he sends here are liable to our laws made for the suppression and punishment of riots, routs, and unlawful assemblies, or our hostile bodies invading us in defiance of law. When, in the course of the late war, it became expedient that a body of Hanoverian troops should be brought over for the defense of Great Britain, His Majesty's grandfather, our late sovereign, did not pretend to introduce them under any authority he possessed. Such a measure would have given just alarm to his subjects in Great Britain, whose liberties would not be safe if armed men of another country and of another spirit might be brought into the realm at any time without the consent of their legislature. He therefore applied to Parliament, who passed an act for that purpose, limiting the number to be brought in and the time they were to continue. In like manner is His Majesty restrained in every part of the empire. He possesses, indeed, the executive power of the laws in every state, but they are the laws of the particular state 
which he is to administer within that state, and not those of any one within the limits of another. Every state must judge for itself the number of armed men which they may safely trust among them, of whom they are to consist, and under what restrictions they shall be laid. To render these proceedings still more criminal against our laws, instead of subjecting the military to the civil powers, His Majesty has expressly made the civil subordinate to the military. But can His Majesty thus put down all law under his feet? Can he erect a power superior to that which erected himself? He has done it indeed by force, but let him remember that force cannot give right. That these are our grievances, which we have thus laid before His Majesty, with that freedom of language and sentiment which becomes a free people claiming their rights, as derived from the laws of nature and not as the gift of their chief magistrate. Let those flatter who fear. It is not an American art. To give praise which is not due might be well from the venal, but would ill beseem those who are asserting the rights of human nature. They know and will therefore say that kings are the servants, not the proprietors of the people. Open your breast, sire, to liberal and expanded thought. Let not the name of George the Third be a blot in the page of history. You are surrounded by British counselors, but remember that they are parties. You have no ministers for American affairs, because you have none taken from among us, nor amenable to the laws on which they are to give you advice. It behooves you, therefore, to think and to act for yourself and your people. The great principles of right and wrong are legible to every reader. To pursue them requires not the aid of many counselors. The whole art of government consists in the art of being honest. Only aim to do your duty, and mankind will give you credit where you fail. No longer persevere in sacrificing the rights of one part of the empire to the inordinate desires of another, but deal out to all equal and impartial right. Let no act be passed by any one legislature which may infringe on the rights and liberties of another. This is the important post in which fortune has placed you, holding the balance of a great, if well-poised, empire. This, sire, is the advice of your great American council, on the observance of which may perhaps depend your felicity and future fame, and the preservation of that harmony which alone can continue both to Great Britain and the America the reciprocal advantages of the connection. It is neither our wish nor our interest to separate from her. We are willing, on our part, to sacrifice everything which reason can ask to the restoration of that tranquility for which all must wish. On their part, let them be ready to establish union and a generous plan. Let them name their terms, but let them be just." Except of every commercial preference it is in our power to give, for such things as we can raise for their use or they make for ours. But let them not think to exclude us from going to other markets to dispose of those commodities which they cannot use, or to supply those wants which they cannot supply. Still less let it be proposed that our properties within our own territories shall be taxed or regulated by any power on earth but our own. The God who gave us life gave us liberty at the same time. The hand of force may destroy, but cannot disjoin them. This, sire, is our last, our determined resolution, and that you will be pleased to interpose, with that efficacy which your earnest endeavors may ensure, to procure redress of these our great grievances, to quiet the minds of your subjects in British America, against the apprehensions of future encroachment, to establish fraternal love and harmony through the whole empire, and that these may continue to the latest ages of time is the fervent prayer of all British America. Well, thanks again for joining me today. Hopefully you were able to learn something today, put some history together in your timeline, in your mind. I know I certainly enjoyed recording the episode, reading through this historic speech. I learned a lot. Hope you did too. If you did benefit from it, please take a minute and share it with somebody. Send it to somebody that maybe you've talked to about this stuff and you think they'd enjoy it. Let them know about the podcast. I've been doing a lot of reading on the history of, history of education, so I'm going to be doing a series on that coming up, probably over the summer. Be sure and like, subscribe, hit the bell notifications, wherever it is you're listening. If you do send somebody, send them to mindyourliberty.com. And if you got any feedback, I'd love to hear from you. Send it to mindyourliberty at gmail.com. 
And I've taken up enough of your time. I appreciate you spending some time here with me today. And remember to mind your liberty.